with you together. Uh, I want to invite you just to turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. And if you don't have one, there's one in the seat back in front of you. And it is just a privilege for us to continue worshiping God as we've already been called into uh, through His Word this morning. And so we're in the middle of the series, Pastor Daniel mentioned that at the beginning of kind of a warning section of Scripture. So we've talked about how Jesus is the better revelation and how he is the better rest and how he's the great high priest. Uh, and the author of Hebrews kind of pauses as he's walking through these realities about Jesus and what they mean for us to warn us, to warn the church that in light of these realities, don't grow sluggish. Don't grow dull of hearing. Don't become lazy and apathetic, complacent in your faith. That we can be uh, wowed by Jesus initially, but then grow dull to the message of the gospel. Grow dull to what God calls us to and is doing in us. And so there's this call to move forward. And so we began uh, in chapter 6 last week really getting into the weight of this warning. Uh, and today, as we continue through verses 9 through 12, we see uh, not just the weight of the warning, but we see the wonder of what God has invited us into in His work in us that we just sang about. So without any further ado, let's just dive into this passage together. We're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 6, where we were last week, and kind of continue on finishing out the section that we are in this morning. He says this, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who've once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again in the Son of God to their own harm, holding him up to contempt. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those whose forsake it was cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end to be burned. And I'll just pause there for a second. It's just reminding us from last week this warning that we cannot neglect and demean and defame the name of Jesus again and again and again and again and be his children. And there's this warning that as believers in the faith, that if we do not grow up into maturity, that we will fall away. That in physical life as well in spiritual life, it's true. Like there, there's no kind of middle ground. Children grow. Same thing for Jesus followers. We, we grow. There's no stasis. There's no remaining the same. Either we are moving toward Christ or we are moving away from Christ. That's why this warning is so heavy and heightened for us. Then verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved... We feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love you've shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each, of, each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those through faith and patience inherit the promises this is the word of the Lord. And so last week we saw this, this call and this warning to go on to maturity. And as we look at this week, the author of Hebrews begins to frame that pursuit even more. To not be sluggish, but to pursue diligence. So last week as we were walking through this passage, there's really kind of a central illustration that we came out from different directions. And that illustration was of a child, of, of an infant. And that children grow. And the point that the author of Hebrews is making to his audience and to us this morning is that if we are in the faith, if we are genuine believers, if we are Jesus followers, if you are immature in the faith, if you're new, a baby Christian, that's okay. That's where you are. But don't stay there. Grow. Grow. 
we are called to grow up. And when a child, if you have a child, if you're a parent, and your child is not growing, you know something's wrong. In the same way as a Christian, as a Jesus follower, when we're not going on to maturity, when we are not growing up, there's something that is wrong in our faith. Hence the warning. And so one of the examples I gave last week is like going to the beach. And for those of you who've been at the beach, and some of you here last week, so you kind of know the illustration, maybe you weren't here last week, like it's okay to bring a kiddie pool to the beach when you have an infant. Like that's, that's a good thing. Put them in the kiddie pool instead of putting them in the ocean. But that's not as a normal thing if Pastor Daniel goes to the beach and brings out his kiddie pool and his floaties and kind of camps out there on the beach. And maybe he enjoys that. You can have your diet Dr. Pepper and just kind of sit there and enjoy it. But that would seem weird or off to you if you went out to the ocean and you saw a grown man flopping around in a kiddie pool, right? As believers, we are called to move from kiddie pool Christianity into the ocean that is life with God. The fullness, the depth, the pursuit of Him to grow up, to move on. And so... As we go from that illustration into this week, the illustration that the author gives us is how do we go on, how do we grow in maturity, and the way that we do that is through diligence. It's through diligence. Instead of being sluggish, we are diligent, as he says in verse 11 and verse 12 of chapter 6. So for those of you who've played sports or athletics, when I was in high school I ran cross country, uh, and this probably seems really cruel to you because it seemed really cruel to me but when I ran cross country we would run all summer long like two days early morning afternoon into the fall and you know what by the time we got to October we were in pretty good shape like we'd run from June all the way into October all this training but you know what our our coach had the nerve to not do he wouldn't let us stop practicing he made us keep running he made us keep going well why because he wanted us to grow. He wanted us to not be sluggish. He wanted us to be diligent for every parent who's in the room. You've got a child, you've got an elementary age, you've got a middle school or high schooler. You keep pushing them. Why? Because you want them to pursue diligence. You want them to grow up. The same way for us in our faith, the way we grow in Christ's likeness is through continued diligence and through perseverance. And that leads to our big truth this morning, which is this. Jesus' followers are diligent, not sluggish. Jesus' followers are diligent, not sluggish. Look again with me at verses 11 and 12 of chapter 6. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness. That word earnestness means diligence. Each one of you, not just some of you, not just some Jesus' followers, not just to super Christians, but to every believer... The same earnestness, the same diligence to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Why? So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Brothers and sisters, we want to inherit the promises of God. As we heard earlier as we were going through the book of Hebrews and read earlier, we want to enter into his rest. The promise of his rest still remains. To find our ultimate rest in God. We want to enter into that. That requires diligence. And it means not being sluggish in our faith. So there's a couple realities that that I want us to see. And this kind of comes in from last week and leads us into this section that's so important for us. So just as we walk through this, this will be in big ideas in your notes if you want to grab this later. First reality is this. The temptation to be sluggish, satisfied to stay, and self-absorbed is real and destructive. It's real and destructive. We saw that as Pastor Daniel led us through the end of chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. We saw that last week as we went through chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. This temptation to become dull of hearing, to become hard-hearted, to become immature in our faith. It's real. It's where we get self-focused instead of God-focused. Self-absorbed instead of focused on the things of God. And ultimately we become sluggish and stagnant. This is not just a, this might happen. This is a real warning given to God's people, given to the church. And we are three messages into this series. We see this for a third time in this section of Scripture. This call to not stay where we are. The temptation to be sluggish, satisfied to stay, self-absorbed. It's real 
and it's destructive. And what are some of the ways that we see that? Let me just give you three really quickly. First, we see that this temptation, it ruins our growth in Jesus. When we become dull of hearing, we become immature in the word of truth. We become unable to distinguish evil from good. When we become apathetic, complacent in our faith, when we stop growing, it destroys are becoming like Jesus Christ, which is the aim and the outflow of the Christian life. So it ruins our growth in Jesus. Second, it robs our joy. When we grow sluggish, when we grow complacent, when we stop trying to pursue growth, it robs our joy. He gives this illustration in verses 7 through 8 of two different types of field. Both fields receive the rain. One produces good crops, and you notice in verse 7 and verse 8 what it says about this good crop, it receives the blessing of God. What is the blessing of God? It's a life full of joy in Christ. But for the field, for the human heart that receives the rain, but because it is not growing, it produces thorns and thistles. Instead of receiving joy, receiving blessing, what is true of it? It's dead. It's cursed. It's not like Eden. Its end is to be burn. So when we fall into this temptation, and for some of you, you might be here, it ruins your growth, it robs you of joy, but then this ultimate warning that we talked about last week is there, is it wrecks your faith. It brings shipwreck into our faith. And that's where he talks about this person who's experienced the goodness of God, experienced the work of the Holy Spirit around them, experienced the church and the word of God, and continues to crucify Jesus, continues to hold him up to contempt, continues to reject the Son. It leads to shipwreck faith. It leads to destruction. And it's this warning against apostasy, this falling away. And brothers and sisters, this is so important for us because we live in a culture right now where we hear a lot about things like deconstruction. And even words like that can mean a lot of different things, but for many what it means is this walking away from the faith, walking away from Jesus. And the author of Hebrews is warning us, this is what happens when we fail to grow. This is what happens when we fail to mature. We walk away from the faith. And so there's this weight that we see in this passage, this weight that we see in this text. Do not be sluggish in your faith. Don't let the enemy destroy your growth. Rob your joy. Wreck your faith through passivity, complacency, staying where we are. And so this first reality, it's weighty, it's heavy. To not go on to maturity results in spiritual ruin. We need to feel that this morning. That should be heavy on us this morning because it would have been heavy on the original audience receiving this message. But just like we've said before going through Hebrews, that often in Hebrews you see weight, this heaviness. We also have wonder. And so from this weighty reality, this warning that the author gives, he also gives this this beautiful reminder of wonder of what God has done, which is this, God's grace, this is good news, will carry his people onto maturity. Amen? That was one amen. There we go. Let's try again. God's grace will carry his people onto maturity. We do not carry ourselves on to maturity, amen? Amen. God's grace carries us on to maturity. As Pastor Daniel said in our call to prayer this morning, this pursuit of God is not one of just self-effort and do more, try harder, and fix your life and pull yourself together. No, it is a pursuit of God. And that pursuit of God overflows into a longing to become more like Christ, to grow up. And so we said last week, one of the beautiful realities of scripture is that if God calls us to grow brothers and sisters we can grow that's good news by God's grace with God's help which leads to the second reality first reality the temptation to be sluggish satisfied to stay and self-absorbed is real and destructive the second reality which is the wonder this morning which is this diligent perseverance 
is a deep well of encouragement, comfort, and assurance in the Christian life. Diligent perseverance, a pressing on to maturity, a growing up in Jesus, is not just a reality we pursue. Brothers and sisters, I want you to hear this. It is a deep well, a well of water, a deep well of encouragement, comfort, and assurance of your faith in the Christian life. And that's what the author of Hebrews is telling to his audience that we see in this passage. Look with me again, verse 9. Though I speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. That's the good news this morning. God is not unjust. Amen? Like sometimes we struggle with God's justice. The author of Hebrews reminds us God is not unjust. He is a just God. And so when our just God sees our growing in the faith, which he is working in us, he is going to notice that. We have assurance and hope through him. For God is not unjust to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, and listen to this, to have the full assurance of hope. There's assurance until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Listen to what he says to them. He says that they are beloved. What does that mean? Dearly loved. He cares about them. He's compassionate toward them. But not only is he compassionate and loving toward them, verse 9, he says, we feel sure of better things. That word sure means certainty. Fully persuaded. The author is looking at this audience in the church and he's saying, I see something different in you. I am convinced of God's work in you. I am convinced that you will go on to maturity. I am certain of this. I have assurance of this. Well, why? How does he know that? Because of their work of faith. He grounds their assurance... He grounds their encouragement in their love for the saints. Their labor, their work, their care for God's people. This is massive for us. This is not just empty affirmation. So he's not just telling them something difficult. Them saying like, oh, I'm sure this won't happen to you though. Sometimes we do that in our culture. This isn't empty affirmation. No, it is encouragement grounded in demonstration of God's grace that it is at work in the lives of these believers, revealed by their sacrificial labor and their love for God's people. What are you saying, Paul? Here's what I'm saying. The author of Hebrews looks at this church and says, I am certain of your standing before God. Why? Because the overflow of God's work in you is being pressed out in your lives. I can see it. I can taste it. It's tangible. It's real. And their foundation of his certainty is not in the actions of these people, but what is it in? God's justice. God's work in their life. God's faithfulness to his own character. And so this is what I want us to see this morning diligent perseverance, growing, pursuing, loving, serving for God's glory in God's name is a deep well of assurance. Why? Because, first, it reveals and confirms God's work in us. Brothers, sisters, friends, look at me for a minute. This is what he's saying. The way in which This church loved one another, served one another, invested in one another, sacrificially cared for one another, was a mark that they were in God and that God was at work in them. So it reveals and confirms God's work in us, but second, it reveals and confirms our standing in Him. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul talks about being adopted into the family of God. And he says that as brothers and sisters of God in the faith, our spirit testifies with God's spirit that we are children of God. What does that mean? 
How does the Holy Spirit testify to your spirit or to my spirit for us to know that we are adopted? Here's how it happens. Our desires change. We start to love people that are hard to love. We start to care for people in God's family instead of caring for ourselves. We start to live for his name instead of our name. And so I want to encourage you with, brothers and sisters, for some of you, you are here and you are growing. If you're pursuing maturity, you're pursuing growth, you're trying to make disciples, you're trying to share your faith, you're trying to grow in the word of God. If that's you this morning, be encouraged. That's not something you do out of your own desire. That's something God is doing in you. Be encouraged in your faith. Be encouraged in what God is doing in you. And if you're here this morning and there's not a deeper love for God's people and there's not a deeper desire to serve and a deeper desire to live for His name, then brother or sister, there should be a warning, a conviction for you. What's happening in your heart that would lead you to not look more and more like Christ, but to look less and less like Christ. And so this passage to us is a call to examine ourselves and to see which one of these realities is playing out in our lives. Is the reality of sluggishness, complacency, self-focus, is, is that the main reality that's playing out in our lives? Or... Is it the reality of loving God's people, pursuing diligence, living for the name of Christ? You know, sometimes, you know, in the church we have people who who will come, they want counsel, they're struggling with assurance of salvation, and that can come from many different reasons and many different means. I don't want to, like, put anybody in a box, but many times people are struggling with assurance of salvation because... They've never known Christ. But another reason why many believers struggle with assurance of salvation is because spiritual fruit is not being born in their life. And what the author of Hebrews is telling us this morning is that if you want to have assurance of your faith, the way we have assurance of our faith is the outflow of our faith is on display for us to see and for others to see. This pursuit of diligent perseverance to keep going, keep becoming more like Christ, to keep loving God's people well. And so we see these two realities in this text this morning, which leads to a practical question. So if you're here this morning and you're saying, I want to go on to maturity. I want to be diligent in my faith. I want to have the assurance, the comfort, the encouragement of Christ in my life. Like I want that to be true of me. I want to excel still more. I want to gain the promises. How do we do that? That leads to a question this morning. How do we starve sluggishness and diligently go on to maturity? Practically, what does this look like? What does this look like for your life, my life? How do we push forward? How do we go on? Several big ideas I just want to give you that we see in this text just very quickly. Here are some practical things that you can ask God to grow in you. Holy Spirit, would you help me take a next step in these things? And several we see in this passage, so I'm just going to walk through them really quickly and you can grab them from the notes later if you miss any of them. How do we starve sluggishness? How do we put it to death? How do we diligently go on to maturity? Five big ideas. First one is this. We embrace the present, active, and ongoing work of salvation. Embrace the present, active, ongoing work of salvation. Look at verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. And this is so important if you underline circle this Things that belong to salvation. Things that belong to salvation. What's the apostle saying or what's the author of Hebrews saying in this passage? He's saying this. If you are in Christ, salvation is not just a past experience. This is important. Salvation is a present reality. We are not just saved in the past. We are being saved. Salvation is working itself out. That's good news this morning, brother or sister. 
If you're in Christ, if you're a Jesus follower, God is actively saving you, making you more like Jesus. Amen? We've said this before. God is more committed to you becoming like Christ than you are into becoming like Christ. And that's good news for us. So we embrace this reality, things that belong to salvation. God, help me, change me, grow me. And as we see that, we rejoice in those things. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, the Apostle Paul describes it this way. He says, For the word, of cross is fo- the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, that active present tense, it is the power of God. So the Apostle Paul puts himself in this category. I am being saved. That's good news this morning. God is at work in you if you are his child. So we embrace that, we lean into that, we ask God to continue to do his work in us. The fruit of salvation would be born in us. Second big idea, how do we starve sluggishness and diligently go on to maturity? Honor God first. We honor God first. Look at what he says in verse 10. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and your love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And what I want you to see is he says, shown for his name. This work and this love that he has given, that they are giving, that they are pouring out on the church, they're doing it in God's name. The aim of their serving one another and loving one another and caring for one another in the family of faith is not just themselves, not just others, but ultimately it is God. Same thing for us. If we are going to pursue diligence, whether it's in our eating or our drinking, or in our working or our time at home, we seek God's kingdom first. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink and whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So the author of Hebrews says, you're not doing these things. Your motivation is not just for others or for yourself, but ultimately it's for God. For those of us who are Jesus followers, the way we order our days, the way we order our life is meant to be for God's glory first. So we embrace the active work of salvation. We honor God's name first above all else. But third, sacrificially, we serve God's family sacrificially we serve God's family. This is really the hinge point of this passage. He says, the way I know and I am certain of your faith, I'm certain of your maturity, I'm certain that you will not fall away from Christ, is their love for God's people. Look at verse 10. For God is not so unjust as to overlook your what? Your work, your labor, and the love that you've shown in his name in serving the saints. Well, who are the saints? The church, God's people. So notice what he says. He says two things about their serving. One, it's a labor. So serving God's people is going to be hard. Why? Because some of you guys are difficult to be around, right? And I'm in that too. Like serving is hard. It's life on life. It's time. It takes time. It takes investment. It is a labor. But it's not just labor. Notice what he says secondly. It's love. It's love. One of the supreme demonstrations and marks of gospel transformation in the Christian life is love. Love. Love for God's people. Love for God's family. Friends, do you love this church family? Do you know people? Are you invested in their lives? Do you love them? could go over so many passages. Let me just highlight a few. This is what Jesus said to us. A new commandment I give to you, that you would love one another just as I've loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And he's not saying that we shouldn't love the world around us. He talks about that later. But notice who Jesus is talking about. A love for God's people. The one and others, those who are in the faith. Later in John 15, Jesus would say, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Well, what is love, Jesus? What does that look like? Greater love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. And he goes on to say, I've called you friends. I have laid my life down for you. This is the way in the church we are called to love one another. In Galatians 6.10, the Apostle Paul say it this way, So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Friends, look at me for a moment. If you want to grow in diligence, if you want to go on to maturity, you cannot do that apart from loving God's people. Why? Because God loves his children. If you want to show that you love me as a person, you care about me, love my wife and my kids. Like when someone takes the time to care for my children, to come alongside Katie, to encourage them, to invest in them, that shows love to me. Do you know why? Because they belong to me. They're my family. Friends, if we do not love one another through service, through investment, through care, then the love of the Father isn't in us. It's one of the ways we grow in diligence, we pursue maturity, is through our love for one another. You might say, okay, well, Paul, how do I do that? What does that look like here in our church? How do I grow in that? Well, a couple thoughts. One is, if you aren't invested anywhere, serve somewhere. Serve somewhere. Just start serving the family. Jump into a ministry. I promise you, if you go back to the preschool hall and sign up to serve, they would love to have you help. We always have more babies than we do uh, people who are willing to come serve those families. Just serve. But don't just stop there. Don't just serve. Love one another. Invest in one another. This could be a message in and of itself. But when you read through the context of this passage, the love that he's talking about is Serving people's spiritual needs, helping them grow up, take next steps, become like Christ. And it's also physical needs, caring for them where they are, encouraging them, helping them grow in difficulty and hardship, supporting one another. This is the kind of love that's the overflow in the church. So don't just serve in a ministry in the church, serve the people of the church. Love one another, serve one another. This is what diligence looks like in our lives as Jesus followers. And really practically, if you're looking for a next way to take a step toward that, jump in a go group or jump in equip. Because go groups and equips are environment where we are around brothers and sisters in the faith. We are helping build one another up. We are caring for one another's souls. We are pursuing one another. And it's just a simple way We've created a medium for our church family to pursue these things together. And you might be saying, well, Paul, are you just trying to highlight programs? You're trying to get people involved? No, that's not the point. I want you, because I love you and I care about you, I want you to experience the encouragement, the comfort and assurance that comes of seeing God grow you and grow your faith through using your gifts to serve others. That's the way we grow up. And we've bought into this lie from kind of Western Christianity that says the way we grow up in Christ is in isolation. That's not God's means, beloved. It's through pressing into one another's lives that we pursue diligence so that we become more like Christ. So we embrace what God is doing, that active, present outworking of salvation. Second, we honor God first. We, we live for him first. How can I bring you most glory in this moment, in this action right now? Third, we sacrificially serve God's family. Fourth, we persevere in pursuit of maturity. We persevere. We keep going. Notice what he says uh, in verse 10. As you still do. This loving God's people is not a past experience. This is a present experience action as we still do we persevere and pursue maturity and then look at what he says in verse 11 we desire each one of you to show the same 
diligent, earnestness, until the end. Keep going. Keep pressing forward. Don't stop. Keep serving people. Keep being involved in one another's lives. Keep loving each other with the love of God. This is how we know we are in the faith. This is how we experience God's comfort and assurance. This leads to a last big idea. Imitate the faith and patience of godly saints. How do we grow in diligence? How do we starve sluggishness? Look at the faith of men and women who are walking in godliness and follow their example. Don't look at the world around you. Don't look at cultural Christians. Look at heroes in the faith and scripture and in our life and say, man, how do I become more like that person in their faith? How do I grow in patience like that person? We're going to see examples of this. The author of Hebrews is setting up some examples that will come in chapter 6 and later on in the Hall of Faith in chapter 11. One of the ways we grow in diligence is by modeling our lives, not after perfect people. There are no perfect people besides Jesus. Amen? Everyone's broken. Everyone's fallen. But we can look at their pursuit and say, man, I want to become more like them in their pursuit. These are ways we pursue diligence. These are ways that we grow up in our faith. So brothers and sisters, this morning, the call for us, the response this morning, is let's be a church who goes on to maturity. Let's be a family who pursues diligence together. And so this morning what I want to do is we're going to respond a little bit differently. And I'll invite the team to come up. They're going to kind of play behind this morning. But what we're going to do is we're just going to go in time of an extended time of prayer. And what we're going to pray for is we're going to pray for one another. And so if you are physically able in a moment, and if you are willing, I want to invite you in just a minute to come down front. And we're just going to pray down here by these stairs, by this altar. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can pray at your seat. God hears you there too. But there is something special when the people of God gather together to pray for one another. And so we're going to pray for one another's growth and maturity. We're going to pray for marriages. We're going to pray for parents. We're going to pray for the way that we love one another. We're going to pray that we would not grow sluggish in our faith. And this is one of the ways we pursue one another by pursuing God on each other's behalf. So we're just going to take the next few minutes and pray. We're going to put a passage up on the screen, some of the verses that have been here. This will kind of guide our prayer time. And so if you're physically able want to join me, I'm just going to go down front. I'd love for you to come pray with me, and I'll just lead us through a few minutes of prayer together.